The most extreme form of bereavement is parental bereavement. And I know firsthand of this pain after losing my baby girl Millie at only six days old, with no indication of complication prior to her birth. It came as a complete shock to us. We never got to see her eyes. We never got to hear her cry. As the weeks passed and we were riding the tsunami of grief, those around us expressed how useless they felt. They didn't know that we too felt so useless. We didn't even know what we needed, but I knew at that point I needed to speak out. From Millie's life and death, this podcast was birthed. Little life, big loss, as a safe space to talk about baby loss, grief, trauma, heartache, and hope. A safe space for lost parents to share their stories of their real life angels, a place for those nearest and dearest to learn about our journeys and to gain a deeper understanding in how to help those who are riding the tsunami of grief. Welcome to Little Life, Big Loss. Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 11 of Little Life, Big Loss. Um, Today I am joined by my amazing podcast producer, and my cousin Cassie, she's amazing. She's my little right hand man helping me along with all of the behind the scenes stuff with the potty. And we just thought we'd jump on today and do um, a bit of a QA. I've had lots of questions coming in. Uh, we've had a recent change in diagnosis with Millie um, and a start of IVF processes and things like that. And I've had a lot of questions coming in on my socials. So we just put up a post a couple of days ago and said, you know, what are the burning questions people have? And we just wanted to jump on and answer them. So Cassie's going to be asking me the questions and then I will be answering them. So, yeah, away we go. Yeah, thanks, Shell. And as always, there is a trigger warning on this episode. Uh, these opinions are ours. Uh, we're not professionals. I'm a podcast producer. Shell is a human being navigating life. And, yeah, the we don't know what is going to be brought up in this episode because it's off cuff and unscripted as always. So just wanted to let you know there may be some things that come up around grief and loss that are triggering we do have links in the show notes if you are needing to seek help or talk to somebody we highly recommend that our first question is from carly she says with your baby girl's condition is it a birth defect yeah really good question um it wasn't from birth that uh, miller's condition happened when we first birthed her, we thought it might have been. So we spent three days, um, the first three days in NICU were really deeply monitoring her. They thought she might have had a um, HEI, which is like a, a lack of oxygen to the brain during birth. When she was born, she was also born with two broken arms and two broken legs. Um, a lot of people straight away were pointing fingers, you know, obviously like, what the heck happened? How did this happen? And um to be fair, I did for the first few hours, maybe day, and Dylan straight away, my husband was like, absolutely not. Like, this is not malpractice. This was not um, something that happened during the birth. Um, originally, we thought her condition was a diagnosis called CDG, um, and we have just recently got um, – and, and at that point, they thought it might have been inherited where Dylan carries the gene and I do also – However, we've since found out that she has something called nemaline rod myopathy, which literally was just a mutation in her DNA. So it's so crazy. One in 50,000 people are born with it. And it's just literally like at conception when the egg and the sperm met, something happened in Millie's DNA that um, formed into this disease. And we didn't find out till birth um, and with nemaline rod myopathy, um, they have brittle bones. They have no muscle tone or low muscle tone, usually in the core, which her little hand, her little hands and feet would move, which makes so much sense because, yeah, um, we had so much hope from that, but it, it's one of the things in the condition. Um, and cardiac also, um, yeah, the brittle bones, the cardiac and the low muscle tone. So, yeah. We lost her on day six to the disease. It can vary from mild to severe. Some people live with it with very mild symptoms and poor little meals had severe symptoms. So, yeah, so it wasn't a birth defect. It was from conception. Wow. And Carly's also asked, is it a wife condition or is it likely to happen again? 
Yeah, so getting the results the other day was like really mind blowing for me because for the last four months we've thought she had a condition that was more than likely going to be inherited. So it was going to be a 25% chance that any time we fell pregnant, our child could have CDG. Um, now that it's not the case, or it could have been that it, you know, happened at, at, um, at, that, at that mutation in her DNA level, but it's one in 50,000. And it still blows my mind because even though it's so rare and the chances of happening it again to us is the same as anyone else, it's still so scary. Like it's still like, it could happen again. Like it happened once. How is it not, you know? So yeah, I mean, the risk for us is the same as anyone else, but it's still super scary that it could happen again for sure. Yeah, that's so understandable. And the last question from Carly, with everything that you've been through, have you got bad anxiety and depression? Hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as someone who has suffered from anxiety and depression, I would say my whole life, like I remember as a little girl being very anxious. I had really bad separation anxiety from my mom when I was at school. Um, and then late teens, I don't recall so much, but later on in my 20s, um, I definitely had anxiety and I was diagnosed anxiety and depression. So in 2016, I was put on to um, an antidepressant and I've been on that journey for a while. So when we lost Millie, the first thing I said was, so they, they, you know, they have the five to seven stages of grief and one of them is depression. And I, I said, I'm really scared of that stage. Um, I am going to cry. You know, I was really scared of what, where my mental health would go going through something like this. And even the weeks leading up to Millie's birth, um, I just had this really, really strange feeling. And I kept saying, I can't lose her. And I kept thinking if I lose her, like I can't live, like I really thought I'm not going to be able to, I couldn't handle this. Like I would not be able to handle something like this. And then the first few weeks, like I was really good. And I guess I was probably still in shock and it felt surreal. And yeah, my depression has been really bad. Like I've had some really, really dark days and I've talked to my um, psychologist about it. And I even went to my doctor and said, should I increase my medication? And she said, no, like this is a part of grief. And, you know, you've got all the right support around you. I've got, you know, an incredible community and I've got an incredible family and, uh, I'm very open with, you know, you guys, my family, my cousins. Um, I talk more openly about it now. My husband is amazing and supportive. And, you know, some days I would just sleep for 17 hours of the day. Or, And my psychologist gave me amazing advice. She would say, okay, let's plan, you know, maybe three things for this week. Like, can you do one coffee with a friend or go for a walk? Or And so it was just trying to get me out of bed at least for one hour a day. Um, but yeah, I definitely, it's, it's, and I'm sure it's not over yet. You know, we're only four months in and even last week was probably one of my darkest weeks, you know, and you go through things like Dylan would be better off without me. Like, you know, maybe if I can just make him leave me, then I'll be on my own. And then this would be, you know, all sorts of awful things. And I know that he doesn't want that. And I know that I don't really want that. Um, but yeah, what I so what I would say is like yes, my anxiety and depression has definitely struggled with the loss of my baby girl. But I've had incredible support. I've been seeing my psychologist every week or two for the entire four months. Um, I keep in touch with my GP. I've stayed on my medication and I've tried to do things for my well being. Like um, I did do Pilates reformer for like three weeks just to get my body moving just before we went to the U S um, yeah, but not over the top. Like if I, I'm not going to go do a, a weights workout or I'm not going to go do anything like that. I sleep when I need to, I had a lot of rest um, and yeah, just tried to stay on, try to stay on top of it and just take each, I just have to go day by day. That's all you can do. <laughs> oh, I just wish I could jump through the screen and be there with you and give you a hug. That's how I feel when I do every podcast. I'm always just a, I'm like, I always just want to jump through the screen and cuddle everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so do I just listen <laughs> to, them. to them afterwards? Look, it sounds like you've got some really great people around you and working with you. You've got really great supports. And I'm not a doctor, but I do encourage anyone that's going through a hard time, just reach out. Uh, reach out to your doctor, reach out to your GP. You can call anonymous lines. Uh, there's plenty of support out there for you, even if you feel like there isn't. 
Now, Shell, uh, we do have some more questions. Uh, we're going to keep going. This one is from Penny. And Penny asks, is there any way that her condition could have been picked up before she was born? Uh, it's definitely not something that they test for uh, normally. And because it took us two years to fall pregnant and I'd had a miscarriage and my age, I'm, you know, I'm almost 38, there was a lot of reasons why I did every scan and every test. I did the NIPS test. And so I went into that birth thinking for sure I was having a healthy baby. Like when you do every, I did the 3D scan, like I did everything you're supposed to do to ensure your baby is growing. And every, I even said it to Dylan the other day, every scan we went to, they'd always be like, she's perfect. She's perfect. And which was so beautiful. We'd leave all the time like, oh my God, she's perfect. And she was. Um, Look, I think the only few things that could have been picked up in utero was I never felt her move much. And I did complain about that a lot because I was very much like, I feel like you meant to feel stuff, but because it was my first pregnancy and because I had an anterior placenta, um, I wouldn't say I was dismissed. I Like I've said that before, but I wasn't dismissed. The, the hospital was amazing. They always took me seriously, but every time they would put me on the, mm, I forget what it's called, but they put a little monitor on you, her heartbeat would be there. Um, a couple of times it took a little while to find her heartbeat. Um, so I didn't have a lot of movement and she was breech. Um, so those two things could have been warning signs for sure, but it wouldn't have changed the outcome. So, um, the only outcome it would have changed. And I do, you know, part of me does wish this was that the trauma of the birth was horrific for myself and for the medical team, um, because we were just not expecting it. So the only thing it would have changed in terms of outcome would have been, um, I wouldn't have enjoyed my pregnancy as much because I would have had a lot of anxiety and sadness and fear, but are we, the, the birth would have been somewhat less traumatic, but yeah. So maybe it could have been picked up in utero, but it wasn't. And that's, that's okay. Yeah. And to follow up that Penny's also said, uh, if the doctors had known about it, could they have done things differently to uh, treat it or treat the pregnancy differently? Now I do know that you have uh, just mentioned that about the trauma around that for both uh, you and the team. Is there anything else? Yeah. Again, the outcome would have been the same. Millie was very sick. Um, I don't think they could have handled it any better. Like they, my OB team, the pediatrician, the anaesthetist, the nurses, the midwives were absolutely phenomenal. In such an emergency and in such a horrific situation, they handled it with utmost care. Like we could have lost Millie at birth for sure, but because they had the best team working and they just handled it so well, like I said, the only difference would have been it wouldn't have been such a shock to us um, and to the team because I know that the medical team have really struggled since Millie's birth. It was one of the quote-unquote most traumatic seizures they've been involved with in 20 years. So, yeah, that's the only difference, I think. I mean, I can't look into it too much further to think could it have been a different outcome. I don't believe so. Yeah, fair enough. I just want to jump to a question from Marie. Uh, she was following your pregnancy quite close, quite closely and understood uh, what you were going through day to day being a friend. And she's asked, was your severe all day, most day morning sickness, your body telling you something wasn't right with me? Yeah, <clears throat> I was extremely sick uh, every day. Um, it's, it, and the funny thing was, was that it didn't start. I was only thinking of this the other day. A lot of people say they get morning sickness from about week six till about week 12. So they have that first trimester sickness and then it goes away and then it might come back at the end. I really didn't get it till about eight to 10 weeks. And then I started vomiting from then. And I only thought that the other day, I wonder if that was when she was struggling to grow properly. And so my body was catering for that. Um, I don't know. But and then I vomited the entire pregnancy um, at every symptom. I had like really bad groin pain from the beginning. I had bleeding gums, bleeding nose, sinus problems, like couldn't stomach anything. Um, and it's funny because I was just so grateful still every day. Like I was like, well, pregnancy is so hard. Like it was so hard. And it's still such a valid thing for people to complain about because it literally drains the life out of you. But oh, I was just so grateful. 
Um, do I think it has something to do with it? I asked my obstetrician, I said to him, like, do you, and he doesn't think it's linked, but I do think that maybe, and I, I was, yeah, I do think maybe she just needed everything from me to stay alive. Um, she, I was at a, uh, acupuncture session the other day and I said, like currently doing IVF, I'm not taking the vitamins and I'm not doing this. And I'm being a bit of a rebel because I did all those things with Millie and it didn't, you know, save her, you know, you take your zinc before you're pregnant to, so that they don't get spina bifida and all the things. And I did all of it. And she said, and it was the first time someone said this and I loved it. She said, maybe you taking all those things and doing all the right things was the reason you got to full term. And maybe it was the reason. And then I said, and maybe that's why I got six days with her. Like maybe me just doing everything perfect in this pregnancy. Yes, I was sick and yes, it was hard, but maybe that is what got us to the end and got six beautiful days with her. And so that was a, yeah, a really beautiful kind of way to think about it and, and probably right. You know, like if I wasn't in such a healthy pregnancy, if I wasn't taking care of my body, if I wasn't taking the prenatals the whole way, maybe yeah maybe she wouldn't have made the whole birth oh wow that's such a beautiful perspective and to be honest I didn't think that way (laughs) I I thought the opposite but yeah that's incredible is it I thought so too okay now uh, this is more of a statement than a question this from Lily I'd love to hear you talk about the power of your faith and your journey of navigating how that looks in the face of such trauma for a lot of your listeners out there that might not be aware, as I like to say, um, you're down with Jesus, but it's not been easy. Yes, I love when you say I'm down with Jesus. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, yeah, so I became a Christian back in 2017 when I was in a really, really rough patch of life. I was going through a really dark phase and really lost and traveling the world on my own. And it was just me and my two red suitcases and I was kind of went to Bali and London and Europe and America and everywhere I went, like I was saying, like, um, you know, the universe is putting all these amazing people in front of me. And I got to America and all my American friends were going to church and they invited me and I was like, oh, no, no thanks. Like, anyway, I went to a Starbucks one day and all these beautiful ladies were telling me about their, their life trials. And I just, they looked at me and they said, what's your story? And I just like burst into tears. You know, I was lonely. I was depressed. I was, you know, I never thought I was going to meet someone that would love me and all the things. And they said, Jesus loves you. And what if you could just take Jesus back to Australia with you? And I was like, that's a really beautiful thought. I was like, whatever, you know, I'll do whatever, you know. And so I did. And then, you know, that's been a, a walk within itself and life's not easy. And so it's hard, but And then I would say I was a pretty strong, faithful person. Like I was like going to church and I was that person and God is the best and, you know, da, 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 da. And Dylan and I broke up for a little while and then he found God and he was going to church and he gave up on a lot of addictions and then his faith still wasn't as strong as mine. And then we went to hospital with Millie and all of a sudden like, all we had was prayer. Like we were just like, please God, please God, please God. And yeah, it was, well, even in her birth, so you're, you can make a playlist. And when I was birthing Millie, I'd made a playlist and this beautiful Christian song called same God was playing. And I do believe that like that song playing, like while she was birthing, like she was fighting for her life during that birth. It was also 11, 11, which is just magical. Um, And having the faith in the hospital was what got us through. And the battle I've had for the last four months, I've been so angry at God. I'm like, where were you? Like, where's our miracle? And where was our healing? Or where's Millie's healing? And where's Millie's miracle? And then I'm like, I was, we we just went back to church on the weekend and, and this song came on and it talked about miracles. And I was like, she is our miracle. Like she's such a miracle. And she's the reason we've started the podcast and she's the reason that we're talking so much about this and she's going to be the reason for so many things that are done now in this space um she fought so hard for six days so that we could get the answers and we're so blessed to have had that time with her and when we're in the hospital we did see all those blessings we almost lost her really quickly on a wednesday night and again we were all praying and um 
I remember that we'd prayed that day for her to open her eyes and then she went downhill and I was like, God, we were praying for her to open her eyes and now she's gone downhill. Like, what the heck? You're not real. Like I was, it was, you know, I was angry. And then our church community were so amazing in this space. Like we weren't, we'd only moved to the Gold Coast a year before, so we weren't heavily involved in the church, but they dropped everything and they were at the church. They were praying for us. They were bringing us meals. They were also angry, like, oh, my God, where are you? Like, you know, and um, they were coming to my house and cleaning. They were just amazing. Like when we left the hospital, one of the ladies stood at the meter and was just paying for everyone's parking on the way out of the car park. Yeah. And I only remembered that I went to an event on the weekend that was at the car park next to the hospital. This was the first time I've been back on the weekend. And as I drove out, I thought, oh, my gosh. And I just remembered that Louise stood there and just paid for everyone's parking on the way. Just little kind gestures like that. And it just showed me that, yeah, like faith is hard in these moments. But Dylan and I have been fighting a lot the last couple of weeks. And I said to him just like three days ago, the best our marriage ever was was when we were in hospital and we were praying and we were faithful and we were being gracious and kind and connecting and being a team. And I said, we need to get back to that because our marriage needs to survive. This There is only a 15% survival rate on marriages after the baby loss. That was something I heard the other day, 15%. So 85% of marriages fail after baby loss. And I can so see how. And so, yeah, it's such a good question. How's my faith been? Because I know a lot of people would be thinking it because a lot of our friends aren't Christians. A lot of them aren't faithful or like, you know, don't have the same faith or beliefs and when we were in hospital all of our friends were like we're praying for you I've never prayed before but we're praying for you and so then when she died all of our friends are like well where's your God now and it's a valid question you know but you know it sounds cliche and it's like they always say like you know God didn't promise a perfect world he just promised to be there to hold us when things go wrong and that's the most that's just what I cling to and What I also know is that I have to believe in heaven because if heaven's not real, then where's Millie? And I just, you know, I know she's with us in our home every day, like, and I know that she's in heaven and I just, yeah. So it's, it's still a battle and it's still a journey and I'm sure it will be, but that's where I'm at right now. I'm I'm standing in faith and, you know, grateful that we got to have Millie for six days and, and I can't wait to get to heaven to meet her one day see her again sorry cuddle her and kiss her and hear her say mummy yeah look she's in good hands up there and lots of beautiful people are are fighting for her hug so she's okay Uh, look off the back of that we've actually had a question come through on instagram from crystal just ask that if the community the church community has said anything insensitive or shocking after the loss of millie that is such a good question. Um, you know what? No, like they have been phenomenal. Um, there's not been any of this like – they've just been phenomenal. I can't even think of a bad thing that I would say, but I, I do know what that question is implying and I can understand how people would say things like, oh, it's in God's plan or whatever. They yeah. have – they solidified our faith. And even though I've lost it over the last couple of months, Dylan's faith was solidified from seeing how they were with us. Um, They didn't make excuses for God. They didn't try to justify it. They sobbed with us. They sobbed. Like the professional photographer in the hospital has photos and our church people, community friends, were sobbing and they'd only known us like days because they heard of Millie and they came for us. Um, Our senior pastor stood on stage and literally asked the whole room to pray for Millie. Um, It's no they've been sensational and the sad thing is because we go to such a large church baby loss isn't uncommon so since Millie died a little baby Rome has passed away they were phenomenal for Tony um my friend AJ lost Benji a couple of years ago like so sadly it's not news to them to lose a baby but their support and their understanding and their outpour of love and has been second to none really and I think you saw that when you came up, Cass, and like. Yeah, and look, uh, living in another state, it's the hardest thing to see somebody that you love uh, going through the hardest time of their life and, and that distance just feels so much bigger and 
just spending a few days up there with you, it was really beautiful to see that support that you had and everybody just just get around you and Dylan. It was really reassuring and beautiful. Uh, there was another part of that question from Crystal, just have you been offended or shocked by anything? Which I think you've addressed in that in that answer. Yeah, no, they've been amazing. And just like even one of the ladies in like a, we have like a connect group that we used to hang out with and we'll go back to eventually. But, you know, one of them is a, a nurse. And so she was coming over and just like changing my dressings or, you know, they just dropped meals, they cleaned their hair. They're just normal people. They're just normal people and they just gave a lot of love. Yeah. Uh, we've had another one from Melody on Facebook and Melody's asked with the recent information about Millie's diagnosis, will that change your journey as you've had first planned? I think he's referring to IVF, which you and your husband Dylan are currently going through. Yeah. So <clears throat> we, it took us two years to fall pregnant with Millie. We started trying to fall in 2019 and we fell pregnant in the second month very quickly. And then we had a miscarriage. We thought, okay, go again. And then 17 months later, we still weren't pregnant. So unbeknownst to me, I had stage four endometriosis and a low AMH. Once I was diagnosed with that, after going to many, many, many GPs until I have found one that listened to me, um, you know, in and out of hospital and all the rest of it, um, we got this, the endo diagnosis and I had my lap surgery. We were due to start IVF last year and then miraculously, in the miracle that Millie was, I, we fell pregnant with Millie. So we didn't have to do IVF, but the plan was to do IVF because I had that low AMH mostly and AMH is your egg reserve. So we fell pregnant naturally with Millie, which was such a miracle. We had the nine month pregnancy and it's been four months since um, she passed away. Because we thought it was a genetic disease, we decided to do IVF because we have to test the embryos. But also because I have endometriosis and because I have the low AMH and when we birthed Millie, they couldn't get her out. So they did a C-section and then a T-section. So my uterus was cut twice. You're not able to fall pregnant within 12 months of it. Well, you're not even supposed to fall pregnant within 12 months of a C-section, but even more so with a T-section because it's very, very soft tissue and very fragile. If I go to full term and go into labor, my uterus will rupture and myself and my baby could die. So it's super, super dangerous. And it was very hard to hear. That was awful news for me to like be told, like you cannot fall pregnant for another 12 months. So I had to get an IUD put in again, not something I wanted to do, but it was a step I had to take um, to, you know, stop me from falling pregnant accidentally in case we could have been passing on this CDG disease in case my uterus ruptures Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, in answer to Melody's question, Millie's diagnosis changes just one aspect in that we don't have to worry so much about CDG or that it, an inherited disease. Um, we will continue to do IVF because I'm going to get say ten more periods before July next year, and for every period we lose eggs. For every egg we lose, we never get them back. So what we're doing IVF at the moment is to retrieve my eggs and create embryos. They call it embryo banking. We're going to try to bank embryos so that we've got a bunch in the freezer and by July next year when my uterus is healed, we can pop one in and away we go. A lot of people when we got the diagnosis said, oh, amazing, so you can try naturally now. Trying naturally is just so hard. <laughs> well, it was for us. So we don't want to put that pressure on our relationship. We don't want to have to wait however many months it takes. Um... And, but it does mean that, so July next year, we will transfer an embryo. We'll try to get in a bit sooner if we're allowed, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see how the uterus is healing. Um, and my goal is, you know, do this cycle, maybe do one more before Christmas, and then hopefully if we have enough embryos, I can take six months next year of just really working on my own self and doing all that internal healing and gut healing and taking care of my uterus and all the things I can do, acupuncture and stuff. Um, but, yeah, we will continue to do IVF to reserve my eggs, we pray that my endo doesn't come back between now and July so that because Dr. Ong doesn't want to do another surgery before then, otherwise it's more scar tissue. Um, but, yeah, and it does mean that, say, for example, we do IVF next July and then I have to have cesareans now. I'm not allowed to ever go into labour because of this uterus, like no matter when. But it means that, say, in two years' time, if we, quote, unquote, accidentally felt pregnant, 
if we naturally fell pregnant or whatever, like it just means we can relax and it's not a genetic disease. So we have, you know, the same chance as anyone else for something mm. going wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a big question. It's one that a lot of people have been asking, you know, because yeah, it was obviously such a big part of it, but yeah, Millie's d- d- disease just kind of added one more element to an already <laughs> fragile infertility journey. Mm. Um, I've got a question off the back of that. How do they test that you are healed and ready? Yeah, it's a good question. I wasn't sure how they would be able to know, but when the doctor put my IUD in the other week, she said, okay, I'm going to send you for a pelvic ultrasound because I want to make sure it's in the right place because of so much scarring. I want to make sure I haven't punctured anything. I was like, perfect, (laughs) let's do that. Um, And whilst the lady was doing it, I said, oh, can you just have a look around? Can you see my T incision? And she said, oh, I can just see. She said, see that big blur there? She said, that is a lot of scarring. So she could actually see lesions still. She could see all my endo scarring. She could see my uterus scarring. So I don't think it's something that they can see super clearly, like, yes, you're healed. But they could, I think they could compare it to the one I had a month or two ago. Yeah, as the doctor says, it is a time thing. And unfortunately, you just need to take that advice and just just wait from the sounds of things. I know. And look, I think that also they used to say 18 months for a T incision. So I do have to be careful and I'm not going to be silly. Like I'm never going to do anything that's going to put myself or my baby at risk. So we just wait and mm. see. Look, uh, we've only got a couple left. This one's from Sarah. And I'm sure this one a lot of people could relate to. Did you struggle seeing friends around you pregnant after losing Millie? That is a good one. And if I look at right now, mm, such a good question. So right now I have friends having babies and I am just like so grateful. Like somebody just messaged me because a friend of ours had a baby two days ago and that she's like, oh, how did you go with um, the baby's birth and I was like oh my god I'm so glad they're home safely I'm so glad that went well like I really truly have so much gratitude for people that can bring home healthy babies like there is no jealousy there is no like I'm just I never want anyone to go through what we've just been through but you have just triggered a thought from when it first happened what I did struggle with was all of my friends that were due around the same time that was really hard um that was really hard and I did have to cut a few people off at first and um, I, I, but I was honest and my psychologist helped me with this. I reached out to them and I just said, I'm so sorry. Like I just can't talk to you at the moment. And I, and I know they understood, like there was three friends in particular and one, one girl I'd never, I'd only ever met once in a hospital, but we just were like online friends. We met through Dr. Ong's Facebook group and we connected over Love Island and, you know, our babies, she fell pregnant a month before me, very similar scenario, had her endo surgery, then, you know, fell pregnant just before starting IVF. And then another friend of ours from Adelaide, her little Sophia was due two weeks before us. And then my friend Amy, her baby Azalea, she actually got induced the day of Millie's funeral. So it was like so hard. And especially because two of them looked so much like Millie, like just such little brunette baby girls. And so I just said to the girls at first, I'm so sorry, I can't, I just can't talk to you at the moment. And it, I ran into one of the girls at the shops the other day and I was like so excited to see her and I grabbed her bub out of the pram and I had a cuddle and she got so sad. She said, she said I'm just so sad that I had to lose our friendship. Like, and because we'd only become friends whilst being pregnant and there was a photo of us in the salon like rubbing bellies together and she said I was just really looking forward to building such a beautiful friendship with you and look now that I am coming out of the brain fog I said oh like for sure we're like we're gonna hang out again and this is gonna be okay but it was just in those initial days like you know and one of them was like complaining at first about how hard it was to breastfeed and sleep and I was like I'm just not the right person to talk to about that and you know but but then me being me I reached out to another friend like hey such and such is struggling with this can you reach out and see if she's okay because I know motherhood is hard I know that struggling to breastfeed would be hard I I know I don't know because I'm experienced but I know you know I know the slept deprivation I know the strain on the relationship but I just wasn't the right person for them to talk about and then one of the other friends we ended up 
going to see because they were going through a breakup soon after baby, their baby is here and fine. And, and so then I struggled with that, you know, and, but I, I've had this guilt that I wasn't there for them whilst their relationship was struggling, you know, it, it was, but yeah, so I did, I definitely struggled in the beginning. It wasn't jealousy. It was not, I'm so grateful that my friends have healthy babies. I just really struggled with the babies who were of the same age as Millie and who we thought we would be celebrating together. Absolutely struggled with that. When I was trying to conceive for two years, I used to struggle seeing pregnant women. I was jealous. I would always, I don't see people with babies or pregnant now jealous. One, because I don't know their struggles. Two, I don't know what their outcome journey is going to be. And three, like, who am I to be? you know, jealous of somebody else's healthy baby. So, and, you know, I've just realized that life is so valuable and loss is so common at any age, at any gestation and any situation. And so it's like, if somebody has a healthy person, baby, child, whatever, I'm just like so freaking stoked for them. Yeah. And look, friendships evolve. And if there's any friends out there that aren't (laughs) being supported by you in the last four months, or next four months, or four years for that matter, and that's for you and Dylan. Friends understand, and you will be there for them at another time when your cup is full and you're able to share that load. So please don't carry that guilt. Yeah, yeah, true. Thank you. Um, And while we're talking about friendships, how has this experience changed or impacted your friendship dynamics? Hmm. Good question. Um, you definitely know, like, this is such a cliche thing to say, but you definitely know who your true friends are. Like, um, my cousin group chat is probably like my besties. <laughs> like, you guys are amazing. I have the best cousins in the world, and my sister. Um, even family. Females. <laughs> oh my gosh, we have a cousins group chat with like, is it nine of us in there or seven? How many? Eight, nine. I think so. Uh, there's also one without you that uh, we have as a place of care that when we're concerned about you we post in there it's such and so I found out there's a what's it called no shell but it's beautiful so what happened was when everything was going on with Millie they started another group chat saying no shell and it was just like oh my gosh how can we help what do we do and so like that was so beautiful I didn't I didn't know what I needed. I didn't know how I needed help. No one knew how to help us, but they, like, my cousins just band together and were like, okay, and they just all flew up and flew in and were cleaning my house and bringing me food and filling the toilet paper and whatever. Like, I don't even know what they did, but I just know they were here. And I wasn't eating. I wasn't brushing my teeth. I wasn't showering. I wasn't doing anything, but no one judged me and no one cared. They just needed me to know that they were in the area, in my space, they were around and, it was so nice. Like, and even now still, like if someone's worried about me, they'll put it in that group chat. Like, Hey, has anyone spoken? I think this is what happens, but you know, has anyone spoken to Shell or I just saw this on socials? Has anyone spoken to her? Like whatever. And so I just, that is such a blessing and you guys are amazing. And even, you know, sometimes I'm in our cousins group chat that I am allowed in, I'll be in there, you know, like just bearing my all, you know, and the girls are just on the roller coaster with me and, um, yeah. I can't remember where I was going with that. Oh yeah. My friendships and stuff. Yeah. It's, you know, I've got one friend that like FaceTimes me at least once a week and I love that. And, you know, I've got some that say they'll be there in heaven and yeah, it's, it's, it is. But then also I'm not, I'm not great at replying. I'm not great at answering. I screen most calls. I don't answer a lot. I am very particular with what energy I have to, um, savor it so that could be a lot of me as well um but people have also been so divine in the thing like I just I'm still getting gifts sent to my house like hey can I have your address and I just like people like a girl that I used to work with at fitness first like 10 years ago messages me like we've been friends you know for a long time but that's how we met initially I was really thinking of today just messaged me for her ad- my address. She said, I've just been thinking this whole time I need to get you something and I finally found it. You know, it's just people are divine, you know, whether friendships that you've had for a long time or new ones, people can be divine in, in their 
thoughtful gifts or their beautiful messages or their just simply sending me like a, a sunset saying I thought of merely today or yeah no I've I've felt a lot of love more than not yeah and sure. I'll add to that uh this podcast actually I've seen such beautiful community around it and look I was the first to say <laughs> don't do it because you know uh, but this is um me supporting you because I know that you're going to do anything you want to do. You always have, you always will. So if you got your mind to something, you will do it. <laughs> yeah, I was quite concerned um, that it's it's been so beautiful hearing these connections with people that you've created through having these conversations. So uh, I think that that's created a really great platform for you and, and this is friendships that you've got for either the next few weeks or months or life we're, we're yet to see. Yeah, and I think that's the thing as well. Like I had someone email me yesterday that they'd come across the podcast. They don't have social media and we emailed back and forward and then we ended up texting and she just said she feels so alone. Like, she, you know, she's um, she had a, a stillbirth baby seven weeks ago and I just said there is a massive community here and I said I, I want to connect you in it. You are not alone. Um, you know, there is, I love that she found the podcast, but I just said like there are resources out there and, and we need to talk about it more. Um, but I said like some of these ladies I'm interviewing, I know are going to be some of my best friends now and friendships might break up in this space because some people don't know how to talk about it or deal with it and that's okay. And I, a friend of mine lost her baby two years ago and she's struggling with a friendship that's kind of fading and I said it's okay to let go of that. Like y- you've grown into different places and that's okay like and I just think people need to um, understand when someone's going through grief as deep as baby loss if someone needs space or can't be around certain um, environments to allow that and have no judgment um, and that yeah in find your people find your people that know the grief and understand it and yeah we're, they're, they're, we're all there to hold each other up. Like I just am loving every time I interview someone, I'm like, oh, I just love you. Yeah. yeah Beautiful new friends. Yeah, you can really hear that. Look, we're almost at the end. Uh, this one came through an Instagram inbox from somebody who is wanting to support somebody going through baby loss and they're just feeling quite helpless and don't know how they can support. So, yeah, just wanted to know what, you could recommend for them in supporting a loved one going through such heartbreak? Yeah. Um, when we first started going through this, I remember just saying to people, I don't, everyone's like, what do you need? I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, just do whatever. And so my advice is always just do whatever is on your heart. If you love to clean, go clean their house. If you love to cook, cook for them. If you want to send a gift, like, a, you know, I'm going to make a website with all the resources because I've just been given so many beautiful gifts, like stunning gifts. Somebody made a giant bear with Millie's heartbeat in it, the sound of my baby's heartbeat in a bear. You can get bears made in the weight of your baby. You can, you know, get necklaces made with their heart prints. I got Millie's ashes put in a tattoo. So my friend is a tattooist and she messaged me and she said, when Millie died, she's had three babies and she's been a surrogate to another. So she's birthed four children. And when I lost Millie, she just said, I have no words, but let me know when you want to tattoo and I'll fly up and tattoo you. That's her love language, right? You know, she's like, I have no words. Like this is, and she's not, she always struggled. I shouldn't say she struggled with my faith, but and the other night when she, she flew up here to tattoo me, she flew from the central coast to Queensland to tattoo myself and Dylan and my mother-in-law. And she said, how's your journey with God going? I said, yeah, I'm struggling, you know? And so she used to call me the Christian sleeve girl because I have like Jesus on my tattoo and stuff. You know, she was just like, she wants to watch horror and doesn't, she's not down with Jesus. But um, do things that show your love in whatever way will make you feel good. Um, I had a girlfriend, re- and, and when the dust settles, that's when you need to reach out. I can't tell you who messaged me in that first four weeks, two months. Couldn't tell you, no idea but it's who's reaching out now that's so important because I had a friend reach out the other day, can I take you to lunch this week? And I was like, love to. So she took me to this like schmoozy boozy lunch and was sitting there and she just burst into tears. And I'm like, what? And she's like, I have been the shittest friend. I said, no, you haven't. And she's like, I haven't reached out to you. And I said, 
that's okay. She goes, I just, no, she goes like, no, literally, like I've I scrolled past your post. I just can't, I can't. And she said, I've, I said, oh, you could have told me you brought six meals around and washed my house. I wouldn't have known. I can't remember. And she said, she goes, no, like, I just feel so bad. I said, she goes, I didn't know what to do, what to say. And every time I went to talk to you, I would just cry. And she has a little girl. And um, she just said, she said, I sent you messages saying, if you need me, I'm here. But she goes, I didn't mean it because I literally wouldn't have known what to do with you or say. And I was like, I actually loved her honesty. I was like, thank yeah. you. Like, that's amazing. And that's all I needed. And I said, just take me for a boozy schmoozy lunch and that's fine. You know, like it was so beautiful to hear that that's where she was at. And I hadn't noticed she hadn't reached out. I, you know, we're in this massive grief brain is real. Like I'll be talking and don't finish sentences. And yeah. So I think my biggest thing is just like, do what your heart tells you to do, whether it is. And we got billions of flowers and it was beautiful. And our house was like a florist, but a lot of people will say like, rather than flowers, give something that's like either tangible or practical or, you know, donate money to a charity on their behalf or something like that. Like it was absolutely stunning, but it's actually really sad when all your flowers have died after someone's died and you've got to throw them all out. It's like, Mm -hmm. (sighs) but, but we, our house was covered in pink flowers and I thought it was absolutely stunning, but Mm -hmm. put so put thought into it. Um, Yeah. They would be my, I'm telling you the person who's just lost their baby doesn't know what they need. They don't know what they need. Yeah, and look, from a bystander's perspective, I too felt helpless. <laughs> I just did what I could, you know. I did what my heart told me to do. I just wanted to be close and wanted to be near you. And look, I'm not, I'm not a millionaire, <laughs> uh, but I made it happen. I don't know how I made it happen. I got a hotel room close by, so I wasn't in your space, but I was close by and you knew that. Hired a car and let you know that whenever you need it, I'd be there to drop in. And it, and it wasn't about being there constantly. It was always on your permission, but just make sure at least once a day, just drop in and always bring something easy to, to nibble on some sort of food um, that's not just for you, but for those around you to eat as well. Um, make sure that, you know, when you do drop in, check the dishwasher. If it's finished a cycle, chuck another one, unpack it. Make sure that laundry basket's at zero, you know, things like that, that are really, really boring tasks that nobody loves doing, but they need to be done and it will help a lot. And it made me feel useful, helpful. Yeah, ongoing. And you guys were amazing. Like I just remember just sitting on the beanbag or sitting on the couch, like, and someone would just put like a half a bread roll with butter on it in front of me and I would just try to force feed myself. Or even like one of Dylan's friends, like one of the blokes came up from Byron Bay and he was just like vacuuming, like just doing stuff, you know, just do stuff, unpack the dishwasher and look, but I guess also ask the permission. So I've always been a person that no drop-ins, don't turn up unannounced. I like my house to myself. I like my space, you know, where my husband's like, I want all the people here. And like, we were nervous for when we first had Millie to bring her home. Cause I was like, I'm going to want a quiet house. Dylan's going to want all the guests. Um, but when Millie passed away, people said, what do you need? And we were like, we don't want a quiet house. Please just fill our home with people and we wanted people's kids here, like the, Dylan's little cousins came and they cried with me and they hugged me. Some of the most beautiful photos that Dylan's little cousins keep looking at is the photos of me sobbing and them cuddling me and they talk about Millie. Um, so ask the question, obviously don't invade people's space if that's not what they want, but that was our request, just we don't want a quiet house, please. And then once I was done with that after a few weeks, I was like, okay, no more drop-ins, please call before you come don't turn up unannounced but yeah so just set your boundaries if you're the person who's lost set your boundaries and if you're a person trying to support someone just yeah suss out where they're at I guess yeah meal vouchers text messages yeah Maybe Uber Eats vouchers like meal vouchers text message just surprise deliveries just whatever it is that you, you're feeling at that time or, or you think that somebody might need just just do it and keep those boundaries. And I remember somebody suggested when I was at your house, put a sign on the door just saying, not today. People will understand. Yeah, no visitors today, thanks. Yeah. Okay, we're going to wrap things up, but thanks so much for your honesty and vulnerability as always, Rochelle. And thank you everyone for sending through messages. And I hope this has allowed 
or provided some more understanding and uh, knowledge around the situation and I guess why things are, are changing so much for you in your home. Uh, look, I was reluctant to ask this one because I know how your brain works. <laughs> um, but Penny has asked that in this have you thought about creating a foundation to raise funds and awareness for this condition that, that baby Millie has had? Um, so when it was CDG, I was, when we thought it was CDG, I was heavily in the community. I'm in every Facebook group. There was only 1,000 people worldwide with CDG. Um, I was definitely ready to raise awareness and raise funds and, yada yada especially being a 25 percent chance um a lot of undiagnosed because some people can have such mild symptoms would i do something to raise awareness for this particular disease i'm not sure i really don't know enough about it yet i've i found out like four days ago so i haven't even done enough research and i have only um i've got my first full meeting with the geneticist this wednesday so to go over it again friday was just like hey we have an answer and he knew we were doing ivf last week so i need to know more about it but I only just messaged someone today saying, hey, I want to start a foundation for Millie. What can we do? So, yes, I'm already thinking about it. I actually was up last night till midnight writing a book as well. I'm, I'm, yeah, I've got a little book idea. Um, we're going to do merch. We're going to do hats and, and T-shirts and all sorts of things because we just want to raise anything. I just Everything I want to do is just to raise awareness for baby loss in general. I don't think I will do, like, something so specific for this genetic disease like this disease you know maybe I will but it'll be part of it I just think there's such a huge community of people that are losing babies for every reason and so the more people that know about the podcast the more people that feel heard the more people that feel not alone so if we're doing these things like the foundation would give funding to raise awareness in the baby loss space in general I don't think it um, would be specific to but of course as I learn more I will be raising awareness for that um, my friend Christy was over today and was like, can we do a run for Millie? Let's do miles for Millie. So there's lots of ideas floating around for sure. And, um, we want to start running events. So we're thinking of a little life, big loss lunch quarterly to bring people together. Um, you know, and, and there might be a panel there. Um, and I guess that would all eventually fall under a foundation to raise money and awareness as well. So yeah, there's definitely things in the pipeline. Of course. I did hear something really amazing the other week, though. Somebody said when now, you know, when people lose their babies instantly, they think I've got to start a foundation or I have to do this. And it was so not. And of course, as soon as that happened, it was like, okay, what can I do? And then somebody said, you don't have to do that. You know, you love your child equally as much, whether you're doing big things in this space or not. And so it doesn't matter whether you, you acknowledge your child's loss through creating you know bears of hope or a foundation or a book or whatever or if you plant a seed for them or you just say their name every day like there's no no one loves their baby anymore any less by what they're doing in this space this is just what this is just the kind of person I am it's like you know gotta keep myself busy (laughs) Mm -hmm. and as somebody who loves you and is very close to you I just want to remind you that you've also had a really big year coming up for your body you're still managing chronic illness and you need to make sure that you are looking after yourself and yes thank you and you need people around you to remind you of those things and and look these are just all ideas and if they don't happen I you know it's okay and like with the podcast I say to people like the podcast literally fell from heaven onto my heart and I just had to do it and it's been working out beautifully I'm not going to push anything if it doesn't feel right you know if someone wants to do miles for Millie awesome you run with that Um, the events are not going to be this big, crazy thing. Like Dylan's like quarterly is too much, but I was like, it's just like a lunch connect to just bring people together. Like it's not, it, nothing has to be over the top. I just want to, um, yeah, bring people together and I just don't want anyone to feel alone. (laughs) Yeah. And I would love for a day that you run out of people to have these conversations with. I wish someone said to me the other day, like when you run out of people, you could like interview family and they can talk about their side of the journey. And I said, like, that's a great idea. Like maybe to interview my sister from someone who, you know, dropped everything. Her, she's got three girls and a huge career and everything in Sydney. And she was dropping everything and flying into state for me. So it would be amazing to hear her story. And I said, sadly, I'm not going to run out of people to interview, which just, you know, absolutely breaks my heart. I've got 19 lined up at the moment. Like it's just crazy. And I, and I hate it, 
Um, but I love that there's a space now that people feel safe enough to share with me. And I am so grateful and honored every time somebody says, Hey, I want to share my story with you. Mm. Hey, we're going to wrap it up. Rochelle, thank you so much for your time and your honesty and your vulnerability as always. And I have no doubt that something in here will help somebody out there really, really struggling. So, um, as I mentioned at the start, we're not professionals we're not doctors uh so if you are triggered please reach out please there is plenty of results there and uh, if you're feeling lost uh with who and where to contact just send us a message and we can see if we can help you there yeah thank you so much Cass. you are an absolute doll i love and appreciate you you were like i was gonna say the best cousin ever but if the other cousins listen then they might get a bit sad but (laughs) (laughs) i'll tell the others the same But no, you're just an incredible human and I appreciate you and thank you for all you do behind the scenes for the potty because I was going crazy pulling my postpartum hair out trying to do the technical stuff that you do. So thank you. I love you. I love you too. Thank you for listening to Little Life Big Loss. If you are here because you have experienced baby loss recently or a long time ago, I'm so sorry. I know this pain will never go away. My heart breaks with you. This is a pain no one ever expects to endure. Or maybe you are listening because you have just found out your baby is unwell in utero and now you have some really hard hitting decisions to make. I am, again, so sorry. These are decisions no parent should ever have to make. I hope these podcasts can lighten the load just a little bit in ways to help understand what the road ahead might look like and what your options are. Remember, you always have options. It is your body and your baby. If you have never experienced the loss of a baby and you are here to learn, thank you. We want to be heard and listened to. You will help someone somewhere with the knowledge taken from these podcasts. If any of today's conversation has triggered any uneasy emotions for you, please contact Lifeline on 13 11 14 or lifeline.org, another organisation working specifically with pre- and postnatal depression and anxiety is Panda. You can find them at panda.org.au. And remember, postnatal depression and anxiety does not discriminate. It can affect both men and women, mums and dads. Please seek help from your GP, a psychologist, your local hospital, a midwife, obstetrician, lifeline or panda. Thank you again for listening. I love you and miss you, my Millie.